All right, got a crucial question for you this morning. How many of you believe in Jesus Christ? Okay. How many of you have had a moment in your life, that moment you know that you gave your life? You don't have to raise your hand in all these. The first one was good. How many of you had that moment in your life when you gave your life to Jesus? And you know without a shadow of a doubt that was the moment. And then how many of you are like me that had like 17 or 35 of those moments because you didn't know? <laughs> Hopefully we got everybody in that. How many of you have out loud at some point said what we call the sinner's prayer? Everybody know what that is? Okay. Different question. I ask how many of you believe in Jesus. How many of you follow Jesus? Try to. That's good. How many of you know the difference between believing and following? <laughs> One. That's good. Good. I got something to teach today. How many of you obey Jesus? Oh, believing's one thing, following's one thing, obeying's another. Crowd's getting smaller. So, for the last few teachings, we've discussed the best I could in three weeks what I interpret Scripture to mean about what end times will look like. What to expect, don't fear, have comfort and peace. It's a wonderful secret. Remember Paul told us that, have comfort. We're not going to dwell on that because if we dwell on that stuff, it brings about what? Fear. So we're not going to do that. But we ended last week with a challenge. The challenge was to make sure that we're ready. We're like the bride. Remember the bride slept in her wedding gown to be ready for the groom to come. So the challenge was we need to make sure we're ready for that day. We need to be expectant. We need to be excited. We're looking forward to the day when we meet Jesus face to face, right? But today we're faced with another set of questions out of that discussion. So if I ask you to be ready, what does it mean to be ready? Does anybody feel like they can just stand up here and adequately describe that? What does it mean to be ready? One answer is it's going to look different for everybody, okay? Is it simply that we believe in Jesus? By the way, if you got the message yesterday, like on text or the app, it said today's a little controversial, okay? So you'll see where that's going. Is it simply enough that we believe in Jesus? Is it simply enough that we say a simple prayer? Because I mentioned a sinner's prayer earlier. And most of us have spent any time in church at some point have heard that, right? Or maybe we said it. I'm not real good at landing the plane for my sermons sometimes, but a lot of pastors land their sermons, they land the plane really well with a little invitation. And you may wonder, why do I do that? And we're going to answer that today, okay? Just giving you a little hint as to where we're going. So here's an example. If you've never heard of sinner's prayer, I'm just going to give you an example of one I found online. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. Fact. <laughs> and I ask for your forgiveness. You need to do that. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that. I believe that he died for my sins. Good to believe. That you raised him from death to life. I want to trust him as my Savior and follow him as Lord from this day forward. Guide my life and help me to do your will I pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Great prayer, right? Phenomenal prayer. Great words, right? Great ideas. Not a single untrue word in that statement. Guess what? Not in the Bible. Man-made prayer. I didn't say it was a bad prayer. Don't look, don't look, I don't want to lose you yet. I said it's not found in the Bible. There is not one place where a believer in Jesus Christ is instructed in the Bible to say a prayer like that. Parker's getting ahead of me. <laughs> and we've covered prayer in depth two times in our three-year history as a church. Not once did Jesus or Paul or Peter or James or John or anybody else ever lead someone through a prayer like this. So the question I have out of it, is this a good prayer? 
Is it a potentially dangerous prayer? I said all of it's true. I could, good question. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. Yep, the Bible says we all have sin. I ask for your forgiveness. We're told to ask for forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. Yes. I believe he died for my sins. Yes. You raised him from death to life. Yes. I want to trust in him as my savior. Yes. Follow him. Yes. From this day forward. God, my life, help me do your will. All of that's true. But is it what gets you to heaven is the question. Now, before we go any further, i got to address a fact, and we've addressed this many times. We live in a world of extremes, right? Everything's extreme. You're either right or you're left, right, politically. You're either for someone or for someone else. You're either for something or against it. No matter what we're talking about, we live in a world of extremes, and it puts everybody against each other, right? So it's hard for our society to find middle ground on anything. I believe that's a fact. Today's discussion and teaching is about finding middle ground, okay? So pay attention and listen and be patient as we try to find middle ground together. So if we're going to talk about middle ground, we've got to start with the extremes so we can check those off the list. Extreme number one, say the sinner's prayer one time, you're going to heaven. That's extreme number one. Say the sinner's prayer one time with me right now. Make this be the day. And you're done. You're good. Extreme number two, work your butt off to please God and work so hard and just hope you've done enough on judgment day to squeak in. And that's our two extremes that are taught in church, unfortunately, a lot of the times. Say a sinner's prayer one time, you're good, or work your butt off to please God and hope you've done enough to get in. And I want to tell you that from my perspective, opinion, reading Scripture, I think they are both scripturally incorrect, and I think they are both very dangerous extremes. And I'm going to do my best to walk you through Scripture to show you. You see, one extreme, this say the prayer once and you're good forever, creates a very lazy, and what was the word that Lonnie used? Apathetic. It creates a lazy Christian. I don't have to do anything. I said the sinner's prayer. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> Keep doing what I want. God's going to forgive me. I took communion today. I'm good. The other creates a worn-out Christian that never feels good enough. If we were to be honest with ourselves, we can probably identify with one extreme or the other, right? In both cases, I think you've missed the completeness of what God and Jesus ask us to do in Scripture. So our middle ground is somewhere between sinner's prayer is enough and you've got to work your way into heaven, okay? But somebody's going to argue with me that sinner prayer is enough because after all, let's look at what Paul says in Romans. Romans 10, verse 9 through 13. This is Paul. He says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Case closed. Easy enough, right? Sinner's prayer is taking you to heaven because you openly declared in that sinner's prayer that God, that Jesus was your Savior. And that's what Paul says here, right? He says, for it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the Scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in Him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Wouldn't this Scripture lean itself towards sinners' prayers enough? If you just read this scripture and didn't put it in its full context. Paul clearly said, openly declare Jesus as Lord. That's number one. Believe in your heart, you will be saved. That's his two things. Openly declare, believe in your heart. Has anyone ever taught you or have you ever heard from me that it's very dangerous to look at one place in scripture and one, just one scripture and apply it towards a concept? If you haven't, you've heard it now. It's very dangerous. You can't just pull out this one scripture is your evidence for a point, you've got to look at Scripture, a lot of different Scripture, holistically. Paul is speaking to a group of people in Rome. You know what they had done up until this point? They'd worshipped all kinds of gods. 
most of them had a shrine to a god before they entered their home. So before they entered their home, they bowed to something that was not our god. Then they entered their home. They worshiped the sun, the moon. They worshiped past rulers. They believed they became God's military leader, Zeus, which was a Greek. They brought in the Greek gods. They, they worshiped all kinds of gods. In fact, if anything ever went wrong in their life, they often believed that they had made a god mad. It's not raining right now. We're in a drought. We have obviously made the god of rain mad. So Paul is talking to this group of people that's worshiped all kinds of things but he's already described to him earlier in romans who god is who jesus is what sin is so he had to kind of start with the basics what angers god in other words he gave them a lot of data and then he tells them to be saved from god's wrath they got to believe in jesus not a bunch of other gods he's not saying just simply believe he's trying to convince them that jesus is the way not all these other gods don't add jesus to your list of gods which is pretty much what Roman Catholic is. <laughs> Step on toes there. He said, believe in this God only, Jesus Christ. Okay, you with me? Guess what? This wouldn't have been a popular message to people that spent their whole life, generations and generations, worshiping multiple gods. That's how Roman Catholic developed the way it did how hard is it going to be for us to take all these people that worship all these gods and make them worship only one so we'll elevate mary and we'll elevate peter and we'll elevate paul and we'll make them all saints and now you can worship jesus and all these other new set of gods okay it would not have been a popular message and it i honestly believe it would have taken the power of the holy spirit to make them believe it would just have been against their norm so if we take this verse, make it our cornerstone for getting to heaven, create a sinner's prayer to declare and announce Jesus as Lord, I think we have an incomplete story. So let's dig into the two things Paul said. Confess with your mouth and believe. Confess with your mouth. When I ask you if you believed in Jesus, how many of you raised your hands? Some people didn't raise their hands that I know for a fact believe in Jesus. Paul wrote Romans in approximately AD 56. Within eight years of him writing that, Christians were burned for saying, I believe in Jesus. They were killed in torturous ways. It's what led to most of the apostles dying. So confessing with your mouth here in Romans means putting your life in danger. And some of us can't even raise our hand in the safest place in the world in a church. Confess with your mouth. Confessing meant put your life on the line, not get out of your bashful embarrassment. I'm embarrassed. I'm shy. These people said, I believe in Jesus, and they were burned. And we can't raise our hand in church. It would have been bold for the Roman people to confess. Do you understand? When, when Paul said confess, he was telling them, put your life on the line. Not be in a church that's got 2,000 people with armed security guards cleverly hidden with their guns. And you say the sinner's prayer so all the other pious people, as the Simpsons called it last week, if you were here, you know what I'm talking about. All these pious people go, we've done something today. We came to church. We watched people get uh, saved. They're going to heaven. Praise the Lord. We evangelized. That's the problem with this Western Christianity we talked about last week that we've developed into. These people put their lives on the line. Confessing meant something. Okay? So we've tackled confessing. Now let's tackle believing. What does it mean to believe? To believe in your heart? We've got to build up to this one. The confessing thing was easy. We've got to build up to this one. John 3.36. Now, I don't often use the King James Version, but today I shall. He that believeth on the Son, he that believeth on the Son, hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Did you get that? If you believe in the Son, eternal life. But if you believe not in the Son, no eternal life. Guess what? Here's a problem. 
two different words, two different Greek words. Two different words used side by side almost, and they were translated to the same word, believe. The first one, John said, if anyone doesn't, and bear with me, I'm not cussing when I say this, I promise. It's Wendy's favorite word. Jeff, you'll have to take that out of the sermon. <laughs> John says, anyone who doesn't, I'm sorry, anyone that believeth, he uses the word pistuo. <laughs> pistuo. It's the Greek word. Not a cuss word. And it means think to be true or to be persuaded. So he says, if you think it to be true that Jesus is the Son of Man, Son of God, you go to heaven. But anyone who doesn't apatheo, totally different word, never sees eternal life. You know what apatheo means? To obey. Whoa, that changes things. John the Baptist thought it was important enough to differentiate the idea of thinking with the idea of obeying. Maybe we would say doing something. So let me read it in the NLT, which I've been told so many times by King James people is an incorrect version. Anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life but remains under God's angry judgment. Doesn't that make more sense to what those Greek words said? So side note, if anybody tells you King James only, point them to this scripture, send them to me. I'm still repenting from the argumentative spirit that I inherited. <laughs> clearly not my parents' fault, but my uncle's fault, I just found out. <laughs> another theme never mind let's don't go there John said anyone who believes has eternal life but anyone who does not obey has no eternal life so to believe means to obey to believe in Jesus means to obey Jesus John the Baptist didn't say anyone who believes followed by anyone who doesn't believe he said to believe is to obey so I want you to say that with me have a little boldness you're not going to die today okay to believe, to believe is to obey. To obey. Who? Jesus. Yes. Some of y'all got that. Who? Jesus. Thank you. Got some boldness, finally. <laughs> if you miss this point, to believe is to obey, I think you miss more than you think. <laughs> Matthew 28. We're going to go deeper. Verses 18 through 20, and this is famous. Jesus came to and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Hang on. I thought Jesus said, go and make believers. No, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given. Jesus didn't say make believers. Has anyone ever seen in Scripture where it says, go make a believer? Because I've been on mission trips where we went door to door, like 30, 40 places. And we said, let me tell you about God and who he is. He created, and there was a fall, and Adam and Eve, they screwed up. But then he sent Jesus, and all you got to do is say the sinner's prayer of me right now, and you'll be saved. You want to do it? Okay, great. See you later. We go to the next house. We never spend any time making a disciple. Maybe the sinner's prayer was incredible for them. Maybe they believed that day. But did we stay and make a disciple? And that's Jesus' command. Been on another mission trip. Where a guy said, we're not going to do things the way you've probably done it in the past. We're going to go to the same house every day. Because in five days of being in this foreign country, we can make disciples. And then when you leave, I'll keep meeting with those people. And the next group that comes in will keep going to their house. And you're like, well, we're not getting very many people, right? I mean, that other mission trip, we got like 40 in one day. Here we got three. 40 believers, three obeyers. Maybe we got some obeyers over here, but we never stuck around to find out. He said, go make disciples and teach them to obey my commands. John 8, 31. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, key word, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciple 
disciples, if you remain faithful to my teachings. So first, Jesus says, go make disciples. And here he differentiates a believer from a disciple. Remember, it started out. He said to people who believed in him, the crowd that was with him believed in him. And he said, if you are truly my disciples, you will remain faithful to my teachings. Teach them to obey. And if you remain faithful, it's not a one-time thing. Teach them to do what I say. Teach them to obey and remain faithful. If you remain faithful, insinuates that one time you were faithful and you may not be faithful at some point, right? This one's about to step on half of the churches in Blount County's toes, okay? If you have a choice to remain faithful, we just shot down most of the sinner's prayer and a whole denomination that says once saved, always saved. Actually, more than one denomination. Jesus wants you to be his disciple, not a believer. He wants you to obey and remain faithful. In Matthew 24, 9 through 13, it says, Then you will be, he's talking to believers, he's talking to current disciples. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, killed. Well, that's a fun sales pitch. We've talked about that before. Come on, come with me, you're going to die. <laughs> You'll be hated all over the world because you follow me. And many will turn away from me. See, Jesus is talking to disciples and believers and tells them many of you will turn away. That means being a believer and a follower and an obeyer is something you've got to continually do. And he's warning them. And he says, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And that's happening all over the Christian world today. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Ooh, we just clarified things a little bit. If you remain faithful, you obey me, and you remain to the end, you will be saved. Obey, remain faithful, keep the faith to the end, endure. This is Jesus talking, red letters. said, many will turn away, but the one who endures will be saved. So I'm going to say this morning, the sinner's prayer may be an incredible starting point. Nothing wrong with it. But I don't think it's the end thing that gets you to heaven. And I think Jesus' words just proved it. John 14, 15, if you love me, this is Jesus, if you love me, obey my commandments. If you love me, obey my commandments. But I said the sinner's prayer. I read the Bible. I know the Bible. I know all the head knowledge. Let's see what James said. James 1.22. But you don't. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. Think about what he just said. I did a sermon a year or two ago, ago called Do Something. And I think this is an add-on to it. To believe, James says, to believe in your mind without doing something is fooling yourself. So we got to do something. Are you convinced? We got to do something. So hopefully at this point, we've sufficiently crossed out extreme number one. Okay? Extreme number two is a little easier to cross out and a little quicker. I'm trying to go a little lighter in time today since we spent an hour last week. Let's address the other side. If Satan can't get you with laziness and apathy over here in extreme one, where is he going to get you? Wear you out trying to work your way to heaven. Work your way to grace. So again, this one's easier to debunk. In Ephesians 2 verse 8, it says, God saved you by his grace. When you believed. Here's that dang word believed again. Guess what? Third Greek word and Paul goes on I'll explain that word in a minute Paul goes on to say and you can't take credit for this this is a gift from God so Paul's clearly saying you didn't do anything to deserve grace you can't do enough to deserve grace it's a gift salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so none of us can boast about it because if I can work my way to heaven then I can brag to God and it's all about giving glory to him for the grace 
But when Paul said, when you believed here, it's a third word called pistis. And it means a conviction of the truth or a word we would better understand is faith. So to believe in your mind, to obey, to have faith, three different English words that have different meanings, all translated to the word believe. Three different Greek words. I don't know what I said. Thank you for correcting me. Three different Greek words, <laughs> all translated the same English word. First we had pistuo, then we had apatheo, then we had pistis. They mean different things, and we have to dig into that and understand it. James says in chapter 2, verse 14, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? So Paul says, you did nothing to deserve grace. It's a gift from God. And this is all about your heart. It's all about you not taking credit for something God freely gave you. But James clarifies a little bit. If you say you have pistis, faith, same word Paul used, but you don't show it by your actions, what good is it? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, eat well, but you don't give that person food or clothing, what good does that do? So you see, faith by itself is not enough unless it produces good deeds. It's dead and useless. So Paul says, you didn't do anything to deserve grace. That's a gift from God. And James says, if you truly have faith, you'll do something. You're doing something doesn't get you to God, but the faith you have in God makes you want to do something. Does that make sense? Paul says you're saved by your faith, not your actions. James says, but your actions show that you have faith. And if you don't do anything, your faith is dead. It's not even faith. And it's about your heart. I can do the same thing. I can come to your house and serve something for you, and I can do it with a wrong heart, trying to earn your love and acceptance, trying to get something out of it for me, build up a, a scratch-on-the-back activity where you can come repay it later. I've done it with a bad heart, right? I can do the same action with the right heart of trying to honor God, honor you. Living out Colossians 3.23, it says, do everything as if you're doing it for God. And now I've done it with the right heart of what you get out of and what God gets out of it. I'm just giving an example. I can do the same thing. This is a heart discussion. Same action, different motive. And this is our final scripture today. It's a little bit of a long one, and this one's a challenging one. John 15. Anybody ever heard Jesus talk about being a grapevine? What is a grapevine? It's not what we swing out of in trees, <laughs> which is what most of me and older know it as. <laughs> I could tell by who laughed who knew what that was. So back in their day, grapes, wine, plentiful, they would have understood this analogy, right? And he's, Jesus says, I am the true grapevine. What does a grapevine do? It provides life. It provides nutrients to the fruit. So he says, Jesus says, I'm the true grapevine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. I believe in Jesus. I said the sinner's prayer, and I'm doing nothing. And, jo and Jesus says, and my father, the gardener, comes along and goes, snip, snip. You're off the branch. He cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear, bear fruit. Some of you guys feel like you've been pruned, like you're being pruned right now, like you get pruned every day. Here's your reason. It's a good thing. So they will produce even more. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. You hear that? Same thing he said before. Remain in me and I will remain in you. He didn't say, say the sinner's prayer one time and you got me forever. It's something we got to do all the time, guys. But we can't get workspace. We already covered that. He says, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. You don't produce fruit. Father cuts you off. You get burned in a fire. Cold hard fact. Okay? It's not hellfire and brimstone, but yes, it kind of (laughs) is. Produce fruit. Be pruned. Keep producing more fruit. It's your choice. When you produce much fruit, you're my true disciples. This brings great glory to the Father. He says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. He keeps telling us over and over, stay, stay in my love, stay faithful. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. He's telling us, obey. You got to obey, remain, obey. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. And I'm telling you these things, you'll be filled with joy. You're supposed to be filled with joy when you get pruned. Anybody feeling that right now? (laughs) Jesus said, believe in me, you're going to get killed. (laughs) God's going to prune you. But it brings you joy. And if you're allowing God to prune you, you know what that means. It does feel good when you get rid of some of that ugly stuff. He says your joy will overflow. So if some of you want some joy right now, you need to listen. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I've loved you. Command me. He said obey my commandments. You might want to listen. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I've loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. He goes on and tells them, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit, so the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love each other. So Jesus has given us a command here, produce fruit. If you don't know any other of his commands, he gave you two here, love each other, produce fruit. That means we need to do these other things that Jesus has told us about. Remember last year we spent like 13 weeks walking through what does it mean to be known by Jesus. So if you don't know what it means, go back and listen to those. Come talk to us. I'll spend an endless amount of time trying to help you figure out what this means if you don't understand it. Jesus is clear. If you don't produce fruit, you will be cut off and thrown into the fire. It's useless. So here's my argument. If we say the sinner's prayer... And it's a start to life change in obedience to Jesus. Awesome. Say the sinner's prayer. But if we say the sinner's prayer and we go about life as normal and don't obey Jesus and don't make changes, that prayer was useless because your actions speak louder than your words. I'm going to recap. To believe is to obey. The words of John the Baptist who came to prepare the way for Jesus. To believe is to obey. Jesus said to love me is to obey. To be my disciple, you obey and remain faithful. Remain faithful to the end. Don't fall away. Your good works don't replace faith. It's God's grace that gets you to heaven. But if you truly have faith, it's dead unless you have some works to go with it. Works produce fruit. You're expected to produce fruit. Everybody get that? I said this before, I'm going to say it again. Your actions, your good actions do not get you to heaven. I want to be clear. But no good work shows you don't have true faith. Maybe you're trying. There's still some sin there you're hanging on to. That's where the pruning comes in. Don't give up. Just because something's not going right or you just are having a hard time kicking a sin or whatever, keep persevering. That's the remain faithful part. It doesn't, none of this should be perfect. Remain faithful. Keep working. The pruning will happen. Allow the pruning to happen. Pruning is not fun. Right? Anybody enjoy being pruned? You need to see a doctor if you do. But it produces better fruit. How many of you got roses? Okay, Jacob, of course. (laughs) The guy that dances at weddings. (laughs) What do you do to roses to get prettier roses, Jacob? (laughs) 
You go to Kroger and buy better ones, or <laughs> you prune them, right? You want better fruit? Maybe we don't have a lot of fruit plants around, so it doesn't hit home for us. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Jacob's pruning roses, guys. <laughs> so both extremes are debunked. I hope you see that. And I hope you see that both extremes are very dangerous. And I told you this would be a bit controversial. Because it's potential that I've just offended or offended a bunch of denominations, and that's not my goal. But I have seen people literally pray. She's going to help me preach. She's going to tell you about pruning roses. Go help Jacob. He needs help. <laughs> I've seen people say the sinner's prayer, and they feel really good. I just gave my life to Jesus, and the next day they get fired, and they go, well, it must not have worked because I just got fired or I just found out a family member is sick, or I just found out I'm sick. So I thought when I gave my life to Jesus, said the sinner's prayer, everything was going to be fine after that. Do you see the danger in that? If we don't explain that things are going to be tough, Jesus said you're going to die. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be tortured. And we're leaving a lot of people thinking I say this simple prayer and everything just gets smooth sailing from this point forward. That is false and dangerous. Here's the other side. And many of us in this room, because I know you have lived here, it's very dangerous when we don't feel good enough. And we're just working our butt off trying to get to God because we'll give up. Both scenarios. I said the sinner's prayer and then things went wrong. <laughs> give up. I'll just go back to normal life. Things were better back then. Or we're over here going, man, I'm working my butt off and it just ain't good enough. I quit. And Satan loves it. He loves both extremes. He didn't keep you from being a believer. He made you give up. So what do we do? Do we just give our best effort and hope everything falls out in the wash, in the wash bucket? <laughs> just give it your best effort. No. If we love Jesus, we have to obey him. And this is going to look different for each person in this room. Start by reading his words. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. There's four Gospels. I have spent five months giving you a daily encouragement. And every day for five months, there's been a command of Jesus in there. Because this Bible reading plan has taken five months and we're still not through the book of John. Okay? That's a place you can learn about commandments. I spent three years giving you commands of Jesus. So you can either go read them yourself, you can listen. <laughs> so please don't tell me you don't know what they are or where to find them. Come ask. I'm not going to get on to you if you decide today is the day you want to do your sinner's prayer and start to obey. I'm going to rejoice. Sinner's prayer is words. If it produces life change, we'll see it in your actions. So if you don't know where to start, read the Gospels. Do it. Start to do what Jesus says. It's not always easy, by the way. He didn't expect you to get it all right the first time. He said, obey me. Start obeying him. Maybe you start with love God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor. If you're pursuing God with all your heart, some things are going to fall into place, some commands. If you're truly loving your neighbor and loving the unlovable people, you're following the commands of Jesus. It's a good start. Seek help. If you know someone sitting next to you, around you, that's one step ahead of you, they can mentor you. They just got to be one step ahead of you, and they can be your mentor. And quit thinking you don't know enough to mentor somebody. Some of y'all need to hear that. It's time for us to start mentoring each other and making disciples, and some people to start asking for a mentor so we understand the commands of Jesus and we walk through this together just like his disciples did. I had a guy yesterday ask me to mentor him. He's never stepped foot in this church. I didn't know him before he came to an event here at the venue, so he has stepped foot in the building but not in our church. He came here to be part of an event, and he heard, and, and I just did, I just started talking to him about the Lord, and I said, you ought to listen to these daily encouragements. He started listening to him, and he reached out to me yesterday and said, will you mentor me? See, he's hungry. He wants to obey. Guess what? He spent 25 years being a drug addict or so. I don't remember how many years, and now he's hungry. He wants something, and I'm going to spend time with him because that's my obedience to Christ. 
And this journey is going to look so different for each person. Don't try to make it look like the person beside you. Paul said it takes all of us to make up the body. If you look at me as the head and you're like, well, I'm just a finger, guess what? A head is no good without fingers and hands and knuckles and elbows and feet and ankles and knees. Some of you old people understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Especially my father has like four bionic knees. <laughs> See, if you sit up front, you get made fun of. <laughs> my point is we're all supposed to be different we're all supposed to be different parts we're all going to produce different fruit don't try to produce my fruit or wendy's fruit or lonnie's fruit or john's fruit let god show you what he has for you and if you're obedient god will develop your fruit your passions will turn into your fruit all right i've knocked on my father for a while so i'll brag on him he's a servant so he serves he's retired he serves. He goes out and builds things for people that can't afford it. He serves. That's obedience. That's what Jesus asked for. That's fruit. So don't get lulled into this thing of, well, I didn't bring anybody to Christ this week, so I'm not producing fruit. Fruit is using your spiritual gifts. Ooh, how many of us know our spiritual gifts? How many times have we offered that? Come get to know your spiritual gifts. All of us are going to be at different places in the journey, so please don't compare yourself. So I got a question this morning. This would be a great place to introduce the sinner's prayer. <laughs> but I don't like landing planes that smooth, so I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to ask the Holy Spirit, where am I on this spectrum? Am I at extreme one where I'm just apathetic and doing nothing? Am I extreme two? where I'm trying to work so hard because I don't trust or fully understand your grace? Or am I somewhere in the middle? And I want you to just let the Holy Spirit talk to you. I think that all of us will sway back and forth. That's part of the journey. If I realize I'm getting too workspace, then I'm asking Jesus to lead me back to the middle. If I feel like I'm getting too complacent with no fruit, then I'm asking Jesus to bring me back to the middle. Holy Spirit, just show them that the search for this middle ground is what's important. Holy Spirit, just show them where they are on the spectrum of extremes. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, what is something that I need to do today or tomorrow or this week to obey you better? All right, you can open your eyes. So now you know why I don't do an invitation every week and we don't do the sinner's prayer. My job is to tell you who Jesus is and help you, convince you to obey and follow him. But you got to do it. I'm not good enough to make you get saved. <laughs> That's the Holy Spirit's job. None of us should have to carry that burden. I'm not saying I won't invite people to do the sinner's prayer. I want to be clear on that, okay? You may or may not hear me lead you in a sinner's prayer, but you will hopefully always hear me tell you to do what Jesus says. And if you don't, challenge me. Father, Holy Spirit, thank you for showing us in Scripture what you expect from us. Father, I bind up any confusion in the name of Jesus that would tell people they can't understand your word because that's exactly the lie Satan wants us to believe so we don't see these things, that we got to do something. But, Father, just give people courage and energy and excitement to want to obey you. Producing fruit is so rewarding. So, Father, help them to shed out those thoughts of how difficult this is or how hard it is to give up something fun or whatever. 
Because, Father, just show them when they get to the other side of it and they begin to obey you with everything that it's so much more peaceful and joyful. When we can shed all that worry and fear. So, Father, I'm just asking you, I'm begging you to show each of these people what they need to do. If they're in the middle already, praise God. Lord, help them to help someone else to get there. If they're struggling one side to the other, help them get to the middle. And if they don't know who you are, Jesus, tell them right now. Have that moment with them so they can have their moment of knowing that's when they decided to follow you. It's not a prayer. It's a heart change. So do that heart change, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.